Okay, uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce Marcel Ortiza, who's going to be telling us about the largest degree in weighted recursive trees. Thanks, Marcel. Great, thank you very much for the introduction and yeah, inviting me. Uh, it's been a really nice conference so far. Um, so I'm going to talk about joint work um, with Bas, um, who was, well, used to be my PhD student. He just defended his thesis and is on his way to Lyon. And that's mainly sort of the first part. And for the second part, we then joined the forces of the lower startup in at UNAM in Mexico. So um, cool. So what is well, it's going. okay? So what's the main object that we're interested in? We're interested in a variation of random recursive trees. And um, so what we do is we take an IID sequence of um, weights or fitness values F5. And then we start, and we're going to build a, a, a grown random graph out of that. In fact, we're actually going to build a random uh, grown tree for, for the purposes of this talk, but um, that doesn't make too much of a difference. And how do we how do, we do that? We start with a single vertex, one, uh, doesn't have any edges, and we just associate weight F1 to it. And then we proceed inductively. At every step, we introduce a new vertex, um, vertex N plus one, we associate an independent fitness to it. And then we're going to connect this vertex to one of the previous vertices, choose a vertex i, um, with probability proportional to its fitness. Right? So you have sort of a growing network, and those vertices that have quite fitness are more likely to, to attract um, new incoming edges as we go along, as we sort of grow our network. And this is a classic model, if I take um, constant fitness, then I get the random cursive tree that's been studied since the 70s, absolutely standard um, object in probability. probability. And um, oops, maybe I should say that as well. In our model, we sort of see our, we grow this graph and we treat edges as directed from new to old, purely to be able to speak about the, the degree. It doesn't really uh, make much difference. Okay, what are we um, interested in here? Well, I'm, I've introduced these extra weights and um, that sort of just adds inhomogeneity to my model. It, it's maybe realistic that, you know, if you have a random network, a random growing network that not everybody is the same. So some people are just naturally, for whatever um, reason, more likely to attract connections. Um, so one question would be here, how robust is that if you sort of perturb, perturb it a little bit? If you add these extra weights, and for for me or for us in particular, um, there is a connection to preferential attachment models. Uh, in particular, this is sort of the model without preferential attachment. So we have not previously had models with where the connection probabilities are proportional to degree plus the fitness or degree multiplied with the fitness. And um, so now we just thought, well, we don't actually know that much about the particular model where you just connect with um, probability. Um, proportional to the fitness. And it makes it makes a difference. It sort of gives you a very different model. All right. And in this talk, we'll mainly look at one question. And we want to understand the largest degree, degree in the in the tree. So we want to know which which vertex has the most neighbors at, at a certain time n. And how does that grow over time? Why would you want to study this? Well, if you know what, if you sort of coming from network theory and um, if you understand the hubs, if you know how many vertices, the big vertices have, that tells you a lot about the connectivity of these networks, etc. So uh, in that sense, it's a very important question to understand. All right, so this is my model. If there is there's anything unclear, please uh, interrupt me, ask a question. I can see the chat, I think. And um, is it the case? Maybe not. So the important thing to remember is just you grow a network, you introduce a new vertex, you um, attach it to one of the old vertices with probability proportional to um, the weight of the old vertex. Good. All right. So quick overview of what's known. I don't really want to go into details here, but um, so the, the original model for random recursive trees where you have constant um, fitness weights, um, then uh, that's been studied since the 70s and there's a lot of stuff known. I, I won't give you uh, much of an overview, maybe sort of the, well, that's maybe the first result here and Janssen proved maybe um, one of the latest results just for um, a fixed fixed um, vertex. So you fix an I and ask well, how big is the degree for, of this vertex I. 
Um, but the question that we're more interested in is the largest degree, and that's been studied as well. And for example, the von Lu showed, oh, there we go, sorry, um, that the largest degree grows like a log n. There were previous results, but that's sort of the, the result that gives you the first order asymptotics, degree divided by log n converges to one. And then there are later distributional results. So how much, if you take degree minus log n, what does that converge to? Um, and then later, a diary invariant Slava showed um, sort of a whole point process. So you look at sort of all the degrees, plot them as on the real line, and then you get a point process result for that. Um, good. And yeah, that's sort of the, that describes things very well. That's sort of what we aspire to try and get something similar to these results. And I, I'll, I'll reformulate that later in the second half of the talk again. All right, then, but what we're really interested in is what do these weights do? And these models have been looked at. Um, for example, Bor Borovkov and Vatutin introduced the model in 2006. Bor as far as I know, the first results on that, they look at height and the depth, but the weights have a, a multiplicative structure. So they don't, they're not IID weights, but they're sort of, um, a, a, they're a, a product of IID weights, which um, makes a bit of a difference. And uh, later results, which are not that old, um, Mayen. We Blabel showed that they looked at the profile, so the height of a uniformly chosen vertex, and there are more results by Sinida Guess and Sinida Guess. Oh. Um, looking at the height and sort of showing first order, second order results for those kind of things. Um, but that's sort of more about the height, not so much about the largest degree. There is one result by Ayer uh, 2020 who looks at the degree distribution, so the, the degree of a typical vertex rather than the largest vertex. Um, I'll come back to that on the next slide. Okay, so there is some stuff known, but largest degrees in general are not well understood in the weighted model with IID weights, I should say. <laughs> Good. All right, so um, before you try and understand the largest degree, you try uh, you want to understand the, the degree of a typical vertex. So what do I mean by that? I mean that you take um, a vertex uniformly at random, ask what's the probability that that has um, degree K, and then you can show that that converges to a constant P of K. And it, yeah, in the random graph world, you call this the degree distribution, the P of K, the asymptotic degree distribution. And that's always typically the first question you ask in, uh, in random graph models. Uh, in this case here, you can write the, the P of K as sort of a, a geometric distribution where you sort of randomly choose uh, the parameter uh, to be, well, depending on how you choose your parameters, f divided by the expectation plus f. Um, and so, so there's an explicit formula for the degree distribution. And it obviously depends on the distribution of the weights. Um, good. Um, so yeah, our results um, works not only for trees. It also works for more general graphs where you introduce, say, a fixed number of edges at every time you introduce a new vertex and connect those. Um, the methods are pretty robust. Um, an alternative to proving this, oh, well, we use what it's known as a stochastic approach, approximation. Um, an alternative, um, and that's what um, I has done, is uh, he, he sort of does a coupling with the branching process. So maybe that's what some people here might prefer, but that only obviously works if you have a tree. Um, good. OK, so we know the typical degree. Uh, we know if you uniformly choose a degree, how, how big is that degree? Why, why would that be interesting? Well, I wanted to know something about the largest degree, but the, the, if you want to get a guess, if you want to make a guess, an educated guess about the largest degree, then the degree distribution can be um, helpful. And how, how is that? Well, the stand, oh yeah, hang on. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute how that works. Maybe I need to tell you a bit more about the assumptions um, that we're going to make in the following. All right, okay. And as it turns out, uh, the results that we, that I'm, we're presenting here depend very much on the tail of the distribution. So how quickly does the probability that, that f is bigger than some little x, how does that decay in x? And um, to be sort of less notationally heavy, I'll concentrate on three cases in this talk. So the first one is just bounded weights. So that we're just assuming the largest weight is bounded by one. And then we'll look at a Weibull distribution, which says that the tail, so the probability that f is bigger than x, x um, the case like e to the minus x tau, so it's like a stretched exponential, and you can sort of work, vary the tau here to get all kind of um, standard distributions here. Final case, 
I uh, won't talk too much about that. That's a Pareto distribution. So when you have polynomial decay of tails, um, and that's sort of the most heavy tail random variable. And the idea is that obviously the, the heavier the tail is, the more likely you see large values of f. So um, that might have a bigger influence. So that sort of, if you have the scale in this model um, between old vertices and vertices with high fitness, that sort of tips everything in, um, towards the vertices with high fitness. And I'm, I'm picking these three examples here, but we can look at more general um, distributions, but um, it gets notationally very heavy. And so I'll concentrate on these three for today. Good. Okay, so now I said, okay, we understand the, the, um, the typical degree, and now we can make an educated guess about the largest degree. And so what can you do? You could, if they were all the degrees in your graph were ID, and you know the distribution, then you can sort of guess that um, first order asymptotic of the largest degree uh, is chosen such that n times the probability that the, well, he, he, this is sort of the, the limiting object, the probability that the degree distribution is bigger than n, a bn um, times n, that should be of constant order, right? So that if you had ID random variables, that would give you probably the right answer. I'm simplifying maybe somewhat here, but um, that's that's how you could guess where the first, um, where the how quickly the the, um, the largest degree grows. And if we want to do that, we need to understand how this p of k, the degree distribution, how that behaves for large k. Okay, so that's the first question you maybe want to answer, and that's sort of analysis. Oh, I should have written this down again. So p k is this geometric distribution, but it has a random. The parameter is chosen randomly. So that's why if you like k, k large, everything depends on the distribution that you're plugging in. If you're taking a, um, a fitness distribution that is bounded, then you can work it out and you get exponential decay of the degree distribution. As you would expect from maybe a geometric distribution, yeah, that's the same thing. So it's just a perturbation of, of the case when it's bounded. And if you take something that doesn't have bounded support, so uh, in this case, I'm looking at the variable distribution. So just to mind the, so the tails decay like e to the minus x to some power tau. And then you also see sort of a strict ex exponential decay for the, for, the, um, for the degree distribution. But the difference is the exponent here changes from tau to tau over tau plus one. It, it's sort of, well, yeah, it's analysis, <laughs> looking at this expectation and uh, analyzing how that's the case for large K. No probability involved yet. And if you have Pareto, then similarly the sort of the, the tail of the distribution dominates and you get exactly the same decay for, for the degree distribution as you would get for the fitness distribution, right? So you sort of see this interpolation. Um, in the first case, that behaves essentially like constant constant weights, the last case, the, the fitness values completely dominate. And in the middle, you sort of get in a non-trivial interplay between um, fitness value and, and sort of the, the natural dynamics of the model. Good. Okay, so now we have, I, don't, I won't show you the analysis, I'll go for the more probabilistic arguments later, but if you have this analysis, you can guess, you can buy this heuristic that you say n times the tail of the, um, degree distribution has to be of order one, then you can find um, the first order asymptotics. And if we do this, okay, um, so if you plug it in here for the for the exponential decay here, you can get that the largest order should be logarithmic order. And indeed that's true. If you look, oops, sorry, in the bounded case, the largest degree grows like uh, log n. And here, this is the sort of the exponent you had in this exponential decay. And the next question would be, okay, if you know how quickly it grows, do you also know where, 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 where do you achieve this largest degree? And maybe I should have said this a bit earlier, but um, if you think about this, this model, there is, you know, have some vertices that come in quite early and up to time end, they have quite a lot, long time to attract connections. So there's always, if you're old in this model, you have a certain advantage. You, you just naturally grow um, just by being around. But if you sort of have high fitness, and that typically happens when you come in into the model quite late, you have a chance to sort of compete against that. And you, you're just by having large fitness, you also um, gain lots of neighbors. So there's this interplay here. And in the bound case, 
it's clear that um, you can't really win by having large fitness because your fitness is just bounded by, by one in this case. All right, so you get log n, which is the same as you would get for the standard model. All right, um, then in the real world case, you get something interesting. The log n is what happens for, for the standard model, but you also get a factor log n one of a tau. And indeed, log n one of a tau is exactly the, the first order growth of the fitness. So if you look at the largest fitness in the system up to time n, that grows like log n one of a tau in the real world case. So you sort of see these, these come together in a multiplicative sense. In the Pareto case, you get that the largest fitness is of order n to the one of alpha minus one, and the same is true for the for the degree. So you don't really see any, it's just, just the weights that play, play a role here. So you have the interpolation between these three, um, three, yeah, these three regimes somehow. And in the last case, um, I won't talk too much about the last case in this talk because I have talked about this in the case of preferential attachment models. Uh, a lot of time. So if you want to know more about that, ask me later. But um, I'll concentrate on this probably most interesting case for this for this model, which is in between bounded and and parated for now. Oh yeah, I should say, so yeah, you want to know where where does where does the largest vertex come in? Is it one of the first ones? Is it somewhere in the middle? And for the first one, we think, I think, well, I think Bass has improved. So um, it's more than just we think that should be ordered log n like the standard model. Um, for viable, uh, it's sort of in between. It's some. It's not four to n, so it doesn't come in at the end. But it's as n to some power smaller than one, so n to the one of a tau plus one. And Pareto, it's of order n, so it's one of the sort of last vertices that comes in. Good. So that's sort of the the big picture here, and I'll try and convince you where this comes from. Um, there's one thing you can do, which is relatively straightforward um, to get started in this model, and you use the fact that, okay, you just have vertices come in with probability that depend only the fitness. So you can write the degree as a sum of indicator random variables. And the, the indicator random variable tells you whether at time L, the vertex that comes in at that time connects to you or not. And it connects to you with probability, your fitness, which in this case is Fi divided by the so normalized, so it's a probability. So you normalize by, by the sum of first L um, vertices. Okay, so it's it's just some of uh, independent indicator random variables if you have fixed the fitness. So if you want to work out the conditional expectation of the degree, that's that's relatively straightforward, right? It's just the sum of these indicator random variables. Each of them, you know, the probability that they give you one, that they connect to you. And um, if you look at the sum, so you have the fi and you normalize it. And somewhere implicitly I've assumed that the mean is finite. Um, so I can replace this, this sum here by the expectation um, by L, by the law of large numbers. And then I've get fi divided by the expectation. And then I get this uh, harmonic series and that's roughly log n over i. Okay, so that tells me the expected degree is fitness times log n over i. And you can see, so small i corresponds to vertices that start right at the beginning. And if you plug in one of those, then your growth is roughly log n, but your fitness is typically also order one. So um, however, if you were to take one of the last vertices, then i is roughly n, so you don't really gain much here, but then your fitness dominates. And that's sort of in the three different regimes, you just get these three different answers. Uh, and the Weibull case, I'll look at that more detail in a minute, um, you get that there is sort of a combined effect of fitness and um, when you come into the system. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's the same same thing. All right. Let's look at the viable case because that's for this sort of first order in um, asymptotics maybe the most interesting one. So this is my expression for the expected degree. If I now assume that my fitness has a viable distribution, then I know how quickly the largest fitness grows. And in fact, if you um, so if I ask extreme value theory, then it tells you that the largest degree in the system of time n minus bn divided by n converges to some, some something random. So for now, the most important thing is how quickly does it grow up to time n? Um, uh, so, and it grows roughly of order log n to the power one of a tau. And that's the same one of a tau that appeared earlier. However, it's, it's a little bit, um, yeah, it's a little bit harder. So heuristically, if I look into, um, the fitness up to time i, I would expect that the fitness is of order i to the one of a tau to first order. So I get a log i one of a tau if I plug it in here, pf. Instead of the fitness, I now got log i to the power one of a tau. That's the largest fitness up to time i. And then I just got log n of i. This expression I can obviously 
quickly optimize an i, you just uh, find the derivative, so equal to zero, and I get that the optimal i is of order n to the gamma, where gamma is one over tau plus one. Okay, so that tells you that in the survival case, you have a sort of non-trivial competition between coming in not not too um, not too early, so you've got high fitness, but also not too late, so that you have some time to grow and attract lots of um, vertices. Okay, and this is the expectation, the conditional expectation of the degree. And in fact, it just gives us the right answer. That gives us the right answer. The, the first order, the expected degree is then of order log n to the one over tau plus one. Log n one over tau comes from fitness and the log n just to the natural growth of the model. All right. Okay, so that's the expected degree, relatively straightforward. Right. And um, what can you say sort of about the next order? So that, that's the first order term I've identified as um, sort of the first order term of the fitness times log n, and the constants are ignoring here a little bit. So what's the next order? Well, you'd expect, naively though, if you take the first order away, then um, the next order terms may be random because that's what happens for ID random variables, right? Um, so let's try that. And we also know that the largest fitness is, um, is of order n to the gamma. So if we restrict now to a regime between s times n to the gamma and t times n to the gamma, so I sort of take a compact window around n to the gamma, then indeed you can see that if I take away the first order term, divide by the, should be the second, correct second order term, this converges to something, uh, a random constant. And um, the random constant is some sort of optimization, um, across the Poisson point process, which describes sort of the maxima of my, of my ID random variables. Looks good. Only problem is, only problem is that this is not the right answer. Um, and indeed, if you want to show that, if you want to have the maxima of the, the whole, the whole big um, sort of, the, not just a compact window around n to the gamma, then you need an extra log log n term. And, you get that that converges to a half. So there is sort of another term that we um, forgot in this result if you want to describe the, the complete maximum. So that's quite uh, quite nice. And the reason for, for this is that you, if you're really um, quick in doing Poisson point process calculations, uh, you would take s to zero and t to infinity, you'd see that this constant is in fact infinity. This um, doesn't have a, uh, this is not finite if you sort of let the boundaries go to infinity. So you need to actually look at a bigger window. The maximum isn't just in a compact window on order n to the gamma, it's in a bigger window. And that gives you an extra log log term here that you need to take into consideration. Good. So that's, um, that's sort of the viable case. We have this sort of surprising set. If you were sort of really paying very careful attention, you notice that. I'd restricted my here, my parameter tau to be between zero and one, or including one in the same case. And there's a reason for that. And there's a very good reason for that. And I just, yeah, the methods we're using for this just don't work if tau is bigger than one. And why, why is that? So my heuristic for this is that sort of fluctuations around the conditional expectation, well, it's, we're looking at a sum of ID random variables, right? So you, sh you should have in principle some CLT going on here. So the fluctuations should be sort of order of square root of the variance. It's a sum of um, ID Benoist. So the variance would be roughly the expectation. So the fluctuations around the conditional mean should be of order log n to the one over two, and then the first order of the, of the, of the largest expected degree. However, um, we've just seen that sort of the second order fluctuations around the conditional expectations. So just coming from the, these extra weights, they have ordered log n to the one of a tau, and I'm forgetting log logs, et cetera. Um, and now you can sort of compare these two terms. So that these are sort of CLT fluctuations, and these are fluctuations of the random environment, if you like that terminology. And if tau is less than one, then the random fluctuations are bigger and beat the CLT fluctuations. However, if tau is bigger, then the CLT fluctuations um, should, should win. So, and in that case, we just need different techniques. Unfortunately, I can't give you an answer to exactly what happens if tau is less than one, that would be nice. 
But I can give you an answer in, in a different regime. Is there any questions? No. And I can tell you a little bit about what happens in the case with bounded weights. Um, and that's sort of the, the complete extreme, but I'm, I mean, well, I don't know. If I had to guess, then I would guess that something similar might work for tau uh, bigger than one, but we're very far from that. Okay. But with bounded weights, we can do something. Still, we need some more assumptions. So I need, in this, the most extreme case, I need that my, my, my weights are bounded away from zero for technical reasons, bounded by one, and I need that it has an atom at one in the most extreme case. And then I can reproduce um, the result for um, constant weights. And that's sort of the, the re most recent results that we have. Um, so if you take the degrees, look at it as a point process, take a, ooh, there's definitely something missing here. Uh, there should be a log, oh no, sorry, it should be log n and uh, the base should be theta, sorry. I should, I'll say take away log n, uh, log n. And then this process converges if you do the right thing. And the right thing is um, you have to look at it at certain subsequence such that, yeah, that's the thing I should be taking away. Log theta NL minus um, flow of that converges to some epsilon. Um, and if I look at such subsequences, then the point process PNL converges to a Poisson point process um, P epsilon that has a certain intensity Q0 theta minus X. Okay, so that sort of describes um, the largest degrees um, in, in this case with bounded weights. And in fact, this is sort of an adaptation of a result by Adaro, Berry, and Slava, who proved exactly the same result for, for constant weights. Um, however, well, that's maybe the last minute I've got, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's not so straightforward to adapt the results. They use some um, really nice techniques and they very much rely on constructing the degrees by um, using what they call a Kingman's coalescence. It's not exactly sort of the Kingman's coalescence you, you know from coalescence theory, but um, it's sort of a way of constructing your graph in a different way and that gets exchangeable degrees and somehow that simplifies your analysis a lot. Um, what we have to do instead, we have to sit down and do it by hand. And the first thing we need to show is some sort of asymptotic independence. So if you take K, uniform chosen vertices, you look at their degree, you show that they're asymptotically independent. Uh, and so the really hard bit is showing that the error is controllable in some way. So it's a quantitative version of that. Uh, and we just do it by hand and it's, it's a bit tedious, but, but it works. <laughs> and um, then if you have precise asymptotics for this, you um, control for vectorial moments of the degrees, and then you can sort of use a whole bit of machinery that give you, um, give you this, this Poisson limit that I've just described, it gives you a CLT for vertices that are away from the, sort of the top ones. So, and everything that Adairi Barry and Slava showed and works in that case as well. But, but we do need some pretty strict assumptions, uh, particularly to be able to control these P's here. And if you give me a, your favorite distribution, you can write it down and then maybe you can do the analysis here, but sort of proving general results is, um, is tricky. Okay, I think I've run out of time. So I think maybe this is a good good moment um, to stop. Thank you. Good, excellent. Uh, thanks, Marcel. Oh, uh, Matt, you also wanted to. Oh, I guess we've got time for one quick question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, on the you, in your theorem three, you talk about the the label of the, the vertex with a maximal degree. Yeah. Could you also get a distributional convergence there? I mean, when you say it's uh, of order n, for example. For oh yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess it means order n, not uh, equivalent to n. Yeah, yeah, it needs order n, yeah. So, yeah, dividing by n, you could hope some... Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should have said, uh, so in this in this case, when you prorate you you get a distribution of convergence. Oh, that. okay. Yeah, so it's sort of, this, the z here is against a sort of a function of a Poisson limit process, and sort of the, the, the height tells you the height of the largest degree, and the sort of position tells you the limit for the, um, for the largest one. And I think we worked it out in the paper what exactly it is. 
it has this, uh, in the other cases, obviously we don't know that, but in that case, in the last case, we know that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, if you want to unmute yourselves and, and give Marcel a, a round of applause, that would be good. And uh, thanks, Marcel. And now we move on to Nick Freeman. Is Nick a, a co-host? Yep. I'm here. Do you hear me right? Uh, yeah, he is a co-host. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to give my talk uh, in the webcam, as it were. So I'm not going to share slides. Uh, if you pin my webcam, then you'll see the slides there instead. Okay. So if you yeah, if you double click on on Nick's uh, picture, if you can. Um, you should be able to see his slides. Okay, if anyone's got any problems, shout out in the chat, but um, otherwise it seems to be working, for me at least. Um, so thanks, Nick. Um, Nick is gonna be uh, talking about Weaves, webs, and flows. Sounds intriguing. Thanks a lot. Take it away. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to introduce uh, a family of objects which are a quite wide generalization of things like the Brownian web. Um, so this is all joint work with Jan Svart uh, in Prague. So let's start. I want to orientate ourselves. So I'm always going to have space running from uh, top to bottom of the page. It's always going to be one dimensional space with infinities stuck at both ends uh, and time will go from left to right. The sorts of things I'm interested in here are sets of Cadillac paths. So not just individual paths, but actually whole sets of Cadillac paths. Uh, so I really have random sets of Cadillac paths in mind. Uh, I'm actually going to give the whole talk at the deterministic level and everything I'm going to say you can project upwards uh, with very little modification and very little effort to the level of probability measures. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of individual Cadillac paths, um, they are always going to have a closed time domain, so an, an interval like that. Uh, two distinguished types I'm particularly interested in, so I'll say a path is half infinite if it runs up until time plus infinity, and by infinite if it runs for all time. And the key property that I am looking for here is that I want my set of paths to be pervasive. And what I mean by that is that it covers space time, right, in the strongest possible sense. So almost surely every point of space time is included in at least one of these paths. Okay, now whenever I introduce a new word, uh, it's coming in this orange color over here. Okay, so what kind of things do we already have of this nature? Well, there's one big class of stuff that we are quite familiar with as a community, uh, and it starts quite a long time ago with things called flows of homeomorphisms that are detailed in a, a nice book by Kanita from uh, early 1990s. So what they were thinking of there was they said, let's look at time S, let's look at where my paths are at time S, and then let's see where they've moved to at time T, and we'll have a function XST, which gives me that piece of information. And then take a family of those functions and you've described your whole system of paths. Of course, what you actually are seeing there are the functions. Now, in the old fashioned Kanita style theory, these functions XST were required to be homeomorphisms. So homeomorphisms, of course, are bijections. Uh, and that has the implication that there were no branches, right? No coalescing. These paths literally uh, sort of, they may have moved up and down, but they didn't really trouble each other uh, as they moved forwards. And branching and coalescing appeared into the system a little later uh, with Aratia and Harris. So, Aratia flow and the Harris flow are both flows where the particles follow Brownian paths. Uh, once they meet, they coalesce and they stick together forever. In the Aratia flow, they're independent before they meet. Uh, in the Harris world, they can be uh, correlated 
before they meet. So there's actually a very rich set of behaviours inside Harris flows. Right In continuous space-time, the correlation structures can be really quite complicated. So we know the Eratia flow very well today because we really see it as the Brownian web, right? And we view it a bit differently. We now think of it as the kind of object I'm interested in, as a random set of parts. So that's been quite intensively studied over the past 20 years. And we now also have a family of objects which has kind of branched off from the Brownian web uh, of which the Brownian net and the Alpha Stable Web are probably the best known. Uh, there's also a, a whole clutch of things that have come from intended applications. So this idea of homeomorphisms was originally kind of plugged into the idea of an incompressible fluid. Uh, in geometry world, there are people who use these kinds of objects to transform one geometric object into another, right? It's a proof technique. Uh, in the world of differential geometry. And of course, we have genealogies, which we embed in time and space coming from population genetics, and this is in no way uh, going to be a complete list. But the premise of the talk is that we've got quite a lot of these things around now. They've often been studied as individual objects, right? And we've studied the sort of intrinsic properties of these things very carefully. Um, what I want to start doing is thinking of a very general class of objects where I won't specify the particle motions. I won't even require them to be Markov. I'm not asking for time or space homogeneity. I want to view these things as a general class of geometric objects. I'll have to specify what that class is, and that will be that will take some time. Um, and then I want to investigate how that class behaves, right, in general. So I'm not going to introduce a single model in this talk. It's going to be quite uh, analytical in nature. But we're enormously helped here by the theory of the Brownian web, uh, which provides an excellent starting point, and you'll see echoes of it if you're familiar with it. So in terms of representation, uh, these, these kind of functional things, which I'll call functional flows, the sort of stochastic flow or deterministic flow world, uh, I'm not going to touch again. Uh, this, this isn't the best way to think of these things. Working with random sets of parts is analytically the nice way uh, to handle these things. So what are my goals? Well, first I'll need a class of stuff. It'll take some time to introduce that. Once I've got it, I will want to think about how I characterize objects like this, right? Pervasive systems of paths. Uh, I want a, a functional sense of convergence that I can actually practically interact with and use, which has never really existed in the world of stochastic flows. Um, and I want to be able to categorize them. What I mean by that is I want to understand the geometry of the space of these things, not individual ones of them, but actually the whole space as a geometric object. So I want to start with some just generic exploration, right? Some non-rigorous thinking about what these things might look like. So let's think of a sequence of sets of paths, which converges in some sense that we haven't yet agreed on to a limit set of paths A infinity. If I pick a path from each of these sets, so F1, F2, F3, and that converges in some sense that again, we haven't yet agreed on to F infinity, obviously I'm gonna want F infinity to be an element of A infinity, right? Otherwise we just end up with a complete dysfunctional theory. But what that tells us instantly is that we need to work with closed sets of paths as a bare minimum. Right? If I take all these A's to be the same object, then this is actually the definition of a closed set. Okay, so bare minimum, we're going to need the sets of paths to be closed. Now, here's a, a sort of diagram of a, a very simple example of the kind of thing I'm thinking about. So we've got particles coming in from the left here, uh, staying at a constant position. And then at this time T, there's a lot of jumping happening. They all jump up and they all are going to coalesce together into a big block, which then goes out along this line here. And then some more paths appear out of nowhere to fill the gap left behind. Okay, now let me just switch to a pen. Okay, so think about what the path would look like if I started from this point here. Actually, if I could change my pen to red, that would be ideal. Okay, so we'll start there. So that a particle starting here is going to follow a path like that. Okay, that's what the environment is specifying it should do. One that starts just here 
will follow the same path, but it will start later on. So it'll be a shorter path. It'll start further forward in time. What about one here? Well, same thing. What about one here? Okay, and so on. And let's say I take a limit of these things. Well, now my limit path is going to have to be an object that looks like that. And this has jumped at its initial time. And that's a very bad news, right? Because our normal conception of a Cadillac path is not able to jump at its initial time, right? Our normal conception of a Cadillac path cannot include a left limit at the initial time. And this is a problem, right? The problem is that we don't have enough time. In a very literal sense, we are short of time and we need more time. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm literally gonna make time bigger. So here's what time is going to be. So you might think of these as the set of indexes for left and right limits. Okay, the set of pairs where your first element is a real number and your second element is a sign, which is either plus or minus, right? Minus is left and plus is right. There's a natural order to these things, uh, the lexicographic order. Right, the real numbers order the first coordinate and minus is less than plus to order the second coordinate. As soon as we've got an order, then we've got closed and open intervals. Right, Closed intervals contain their endpoints, open intervals do not. And as soon as we've got open intervals, we've got a topology generated by those open intervals. So what does that topology look like? So ignore the bullet points for the moment. So this space looks like two copies of the real line. Let's call one of the copies plus and the other copy minus. Now in the plus copy, when you move continuously, you're only allowed to move rightwards. In the minus copy, when you move continuously, you have to move leftwards. If you want to jump between these two lines, you have to make a discontinuous movement in space. OK, so that corresponds to the first two bullet points. And this third bullet point is the discontinuous bit that says that T minus and T plus are actually not close in space. OK. So this is not metrizable and you might reasonably panic at this point and then you might panic a bit more because it's totally disconnected. Right. But actually, this is very much a continuum. It's a continuum that has an intrinsic sense of left and right in a way that the real numbers simply don't. So what's it got going for it? Well, it is separate and Hausdorff, and if it wasn't, we'd have to give up and go home. But actually, the heine borel theorem holds here. And that, that's the point where you really start thinking this is going to behave quite like the real numbers. So compactness, sequential compactness, closed and boundedness are all equivalent in this space, which I, I think it's called, oh, I can't, it begins with L. There is a, there's a name in topology for it. Strong Lindelhoff property or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> so the property of this space that I really care about for purposes of this talk is the following lemma. This is not new. Um, Continuity on this R plus minus space is basically equivalent to Cadlagness on the real numbers. Okay, so what do I mean precisely here? Well, my conception of a Cadlag function is now going to be defined on an interval that goes from A minus up to B plus, and that's allowed me to include a left limit at the value F A minus. F being continuous, in the sense I've just described, right? This is a subinterval of R plus minus and inherits the topology from R plus minus. That continuity is equivalent to the usual notion of Cadlagness, but we've now got a left limit at the initial value. And additionally, what we've got is time symmetry, right? Usually we don't have that in, the, in our traditional notion of a Cadlag function, but here you can actually flip the direction of time and everything looks exactly like it did when you started. Better still, if we just impose the convention that when we say f of t, we mean the right hand limit f t plus, then we have all of our normal notation for Cadillac paths and it works exactly like it always did. Okay, so this is what I now mean by a Cadillac path. So 
So having got that sorted, I now want to think about the space of paths, and I'm going to gradually build upwards now uh, to a point where I can think about sets of CADLAG paths. So I always want to associate paths with their interpolated graph. So what I mean by that is the subset of space time, which is their graph, but I want to include the jumps as vertical line segments. Okay, that's what's happening with these inequalities here. So you give me a, a, a Cadillac path F, H of F is what I call its interpolated graph. Now the metric on paths is a Skorogod metric, but it's the M1 metric, and I'll say why a bit later on. So this is very, very similar to the usual J1 metric that we're all familiar with. The only difference, it's slightly weaker. We allow two objects like the ones in this picture here, and let me switch back to a laser pointer, like the ones in this picture here, two objects like that are allowed to be close together in this world. So you can have a little jump in the middle of a big jump, and that's a sort of continuous, uh, and it's not a big change in the M1 world. But it's still quite a strong metric. Um, rigorously, what we're looking at is we take parameterizations of the interpolated graphs, and then you try to match them up in the L infinity sense. Okay, If you do this with the, the normal closed graphs, then you get the J1 topology. The fact that we're using the interpolated bits with the jumps, that's what leads to the M1 uh, topology. Okay. And there's a natural partial order on paths, which you might call the order of path extension. Okay, so F1 is less than F2. If I can look at, take the endpoints of F1, add a little bit on to each endpoint, and then get to F2. Right? And you might think of that as set inclusion of the interpolated graphs. In fact, I need to be after a little more careful if there's some degenerate cases where I need to specify that this set inclusion also preserves the time order. Right. You, you might also think of this as the sort of background here is we're looking at a sort of Hausdorff metric uh, topology, but trying to preserve the order of time. That's what the M1 metric really is. OK, so moving up now to sets of paths. So now I want to use the Hausdorff metric. And of course, this is a, a, an insight that's coming from the Brownian web world. So the way the Hausdorff metric works is uh, two sets are similar if when I pick an object in one of them, I can find a similar object in the other one. OK, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate in this diagram over here. Um, these are not meant to be paths. These are just two shapes that would be similar if you applied the Hausdorff metric to R2. What I actually want to do is apply it to sets of paths. So this dm here is the m1 metric from the previous slide. Uh, the Hausdorff metric is a metric on compact sets. OK, so I now need to work closed, closed sets are not quite enough. In fact, the things I want to work with are compact sets of paths. Uh, in practice, there's no loss of functionality by imposing that restriction. Uh, the M1 topology is pretty friendly. And I need to upgrade my partial order as well. But there's a subtlety that comes in here. OK, so I want you to focus on the intuition first here. So A less than or equal to B at the level of sets of paths means that B covers space time more efficiently. So this is the key word, more efficiently than A. OK, and that means it's going to potentially cover more of space time and it's going to do it using fewer and longer paths. OK, so making a path longer kind of makes you go up in this order getting rid of a path that you didn't need because some other path already covered that bit of space time makes you go up in the order. OK, so it's a, you're trying to cover space time with as few paths and with as longer paths as you possibly can. That's the order here. So that's implemented by these quantifiers here. The top one is, is doing uh, longer and the bottom one is doing fewer, but it takes a bit of work to parse them. Uh, I, I don't suggest trying to do it unless you really want to. OK, so I'm now at a point where I have a functioning uh, a sort of space in which to work with sets of paths. And just to make my life easier in terms of speaking, uh, all paths from now on are going to be half infinite. So all of them will be defined up till time plus infinity. They might start at different times, of course. They'll, of course, all be Cadillac. And the last thing I want to do is a compactification exercise. So for the moment, I've talked as though space time was some big infinite box. 
Uh, in fact, what I want to do is glue everything at time minus infinity together, glue everything at time plus infinity together. So this is exactly the same space-time compactification as the theory of the Brownian web uh, has used. It's, it's very much the right thing to do in this situation. It's just a way of saying, I don't care what happens near the edges of my box. And I don't want to go to the details, but it's the right way to do that. Okay, so these are the things that I'm interested in. Weaves. So a weave is a set of Cadlag half-infinite paths that are compact in the sense I've set up, pervasive, so they cover space-time in the almost sure sense, and I want them to be non-crossing as well. I'm going to appeal to your intuition for what non-crossing means. Uh, it'll save me a, a bit of time. There are two particular kinds of weave that I'm interested in. And I have here a definition of a web, which is a generalization of the idea of a web, which you might be familiar with. So a weave is said to be a web if it's minimal in the partial order I just introduced. And it's said to be a flow if it's maximal in the partial order. Okay, so I'm slightly expropriating the definition of the word flow here, right? It has a classical meaning, which I don't want to use. I don't think it's the right sort of word. You'll see why in a moment. Uh, a flow is a, a maximal weave. Now, this partial order is potentially a very irregular thing, right? Partial orders can have minima and maxima in all kinds of odd places. Um, but actually, there's a very nice structure to this space. So let's say I start here with a web. And then I look at the stuff which is above that web in the partial order. So some things will be incomparable to it, other things will be above it. So we start to draw out the cone of stuff that's above it in this partial order. It turns out that it kind of folds back together again, and there's a unique flow at the top, okay? So this partial order actually has a nice property. Its minimal and maximal elements are literally paired together in bijective correspondence. And then in between each pair, there's a load of incomparable stuff. Okay, and then there's another pair over here, a different web and a different flow, a different web and a different flow paired together, right, and so on. Now, extremal points are the sort of things that ought to be uh, fixed point in fixed point theorems. And there is an operation which takes a weave, so an object in the middle here, and which maps it in a quite explicit way to the associated flow and maps it to the associated web using a different operation. So in lack of creativity, I'm going to call the operation that does this downwards arrow web and the operation that does this upwards arrow flow. I'm not going to quite have time to tell you what they are, but it turns out that the webs and the flows are precisely the fixed points of this operation. Now, the, in fact, the web operation looks very much like the thing in the Brownian web kind of theory, where you take a, a dense skeleton of paths and then close it. The flow operation uh, is, is a slightly simpler object. All you do then is you take all the bi-infinite paths that don't cross the weave, and that gives you back auto, something that's automatically closed and compact. Okay, so, oh, didn't mean to introduce that line there. So I don't have time to tell you about the objects, the web and the flow operations, so I'm gonna have to skip those two slides. But all the information that I've just given you is written in words in this first theorem, right? This is the sort of the categorization theorem, which is telling you the structure of the space of weaves at sort of first level, how it looks. Okay. And it has something here that I didn't quite get to mention, which is that something being a flow, it's not only equivalent to being a fixed point of the flow operation, it's also equivalent to consisting entirely of bi-infinite paths. And that's why I want to use the word flow for these things, okay? A weave is a flow when and only when all of the paths are bi-infinite, so they extend by infinity all the way through to time plus infinity. And there's a very natural piece of structure that we've sort of already done, 
right? We should have an equivalence relation that says those, those sort of diamond shapes that I drew one slide ago, we should think of those as equivalence classes. And the equivalence relation rigorously says you've got the same web or you've got the same flow, right? They're exactly equivalent. That's a bit of geometry that we might not have expected uh, sitting inside our space of weaves. So the next thing I want to think about is how we characterize a weave in a way that we can properly interact with it. And I'm gonna do that using particle motions. So I need to define what I mean by a particle motion. Okay, so let's fix a point Z in space time. So this is this blue object in the middle here. Look at the path going through Z. Okay, now it's actually possibly there's several paths going through Z. But let's just say for the moment there's just one of them. Cross out all of the stuff that happened before Z and just take the path segment after Z. Okay, now that's the particle motion going through Z. Now that's going to cause me some trouble if coming outwards from Z, I've got paths going in more than one direction. Now, it is a, a fact, it's a, a not a particularly easy to prove fact, but it is a fact that in a weave, Lebesgue almost every space time point will have the property that the paths going outwards from it will all go in the same direction. So you can think of that as a sort of version of what we have in the Brownian web world, where uh, you have the special points and the special points are fractal sets, but they are Lebesgue null fractal sets. Okay, we have to be slightly more careful here because we can have several paths that, if you like, follow the same outgoing trajectory. So that's the particle motion. I can then work, think of particle motions from multiple space-time points, a finite set of space-time points. Now, what my characterization theorem says is that the particle motions from finite sets of space-time points characterize weaves, but at the level of equivalence classes, right? They do not characterize at the level of webs and flows, they characterize at the level of equivalence classes of weaves. And you don't have to worry about this last statement. This is essentially coming from the bit that I've skipped. Uh, ramification is the, the sort of mechanism for making sure that this operation that I've drawn as a diagram is well defined. Uh, <clears throat> but that is not necessary really to make sense of the theorems. Now it would be great if our convergence theorem matched our characterization, right? So convergence is coming next. And if we restrict to flows, then everything looks quite good, right? Convergence of flows is absolutely uh, equivalent to convergence of particle motions. But that's not true if we look at general weaves, okay? If I have a sequence of weaves that converges to a weave, that certainly implies convergence of particle motions, but convergence of particle motions is equivalent to convergence of weaves at the level of equivalence classes, okay? So this provides a lovely explanation of all of the trouble that people have run into when they try to prove convergence to the Brownian web. Um, maximality of the partial order here is preserved when you take limits, that's the flows, Minimality, if you try and take convergence of webs, that's not preserved when you take limits. Okay, and that introduces a bit of asymmetry. But this structure essentially makes the whole thing nice and, and easy to work with again, because you take limits with your particle motions, right, which you do using the classical theory of weak convergence, which we understand very well. And then you just don't worry that what you get out at the end might not be a web. You just say, well, it's in the equivalence class, so it's a very similar object. And that's actually the natural level to work at for these weaves. And really what's going on here is that the set of by infinite paths is closed, right? And that, uh, that sort of if it interacts with this idea of uh, taking limits of particle motions. And it, it's really that that gives you this nice property of flows that you don't get for webs. Okay, so I should probably stop there. I mean, there's a lot uh, that I could go on to from this, but I'm, I'm almost out of time and a bit over, so apologies for that. All right, thanks so much. Um, what do you think, uh, Matt? Uh, maybe, maybe we should indeed take discussions to the coffee break because we're really uh, well. If there is one quick 
question, we might take it. But I guess the answer is not going to be quick anyway. <laughs> it, it... All right. Yeah. So uh, I suggest we, we take questions to the coffee break. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nick, for a very inspiring talk. Um, OK, feel free to unmute your phone and your microphone and clap. All right, so let's head to the coffee break.